Welcome, everyone, to the second episode of the Usual Places Modcast. I'm Scotch, also known as Jordan. If you didn't catch our first episode, that is now out on Spotify as well as on YouTube. In case you didn't know, this is a new podcast talking about the original Xbox console, the modding scene behind it, the people who influenced the culture around it, and the people who kept it alive all these years, about 23 years later. We got a lot of talented and smart individuals on this call, and we want to hear from them and kind of give newcomers and longtime people in the scene some insights into these untold stories. So to start out, I'm going to list off some of the speakers here just so you can hear their voices and put a name to the face or name to the voice rather. Starting off with Equinox, if you want to say hi real quick. Hi, it's me. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Equinox from uh, Team Resurgent. So, yeah. Not sure what else to say, really. But um... by the way, for anyone listening, if you haven't caught the first episode, we did about a 20, 30 minute long introduction where we explained sort of our history in the scene and stuff like that. So if you don't quite recognize some of these names or recognize the voices, I definitely recommend you go checking out episode one. We also got Higuero in the chat. Hi, everyone. Good to be back. Yeah, Higuero is one of the admins here on the Xbox Team Discord and one of the cohorts that helped us sort of found this this podcast so we also got harcroft in the chat hello uh nice to not i guess or hear you all nice to be back and then we also got um rocky five who is um joining us from i assume scotland ireland scotland i'm for scotland and hello i appreciate you coming on rocky we also got rowdy from uh team avalanche hey rowdy Hey, everybody. Welcome to be back the second time. Welcome back. And then we also got Sky, our hard drive and data analyst expert. Hi, everyone. How's it going? Yeah, thank you, everyone, for joining. So to begin, we can kind of talk about news and new stuff going on. I know there's uh, some news coming from Hardcraft. Maybe I'll let you take the floor here in a second. One thing I do want to talk about real quick, kind of hot off the press, is so the Xbox One's boot ROM has apparently been compromised or has been exploited to some degree. So I'm going to read off the tweet here, and I'll probably show it on screen too for any video watchers later on. User Doom over at Obscure Gamers Discord managed to get code execution on Xbox One's boot ROM before anything else, keys included, is loaded. So I'll admit, I don't have a whole lot of familiarity with this topic, but we were kind of talking about this in sort of the pre-show. So maybe if someone wants to kind of talk about the implications that this unlocks, or maybe some of the caveats to be aware of. Equinox, I know you and I were kind of chatting about it a little bit ago. Yeah, I'm, I'm not too sure what exactly it will give you access to do, but I assume, obviously, if it's at such an early stage, then that's a good way that you could hook into later stages and, you know, get more wider access. Time will tell. Yeah, and then there was also that uh, second... Is it a glitch or an exploit relating to the, um, the yeah. uh, ongoing dev dev mode? Yeah, so there's the way that if you have a XDK, which would normally call home to renew its license, there's this way of, from what I understand, is removing the battery, um, letting that discharge, and then then the Xbox, when it does call home, it just can't, it will just stay permanently activated. So that will never get banned. And I believe yep, that, and... that's probably certain versions of the OS that mm. are impacted by that. But um, we are sort of in talks with uh, a few of the guys from, I guess, that part of the scene. And they may be able to provide a little bit more in-depth information of what that really means. But it is quite interesting, to be honest. Yeah, and just to clarify, I don't know if anyone knows, but so this is relating to what the first generation Xbox, the Xbox One from 2013, or is this any more recent consoles or revisions? I believe it's um, maybe the first gen or just the Xbox One. But with that being said, I haven't looked into it in depth. Uh, it might impact maybe newer gen, but nothing's really been said, to be honest. It's actually come out as a surprise to a lot of people. Yeah, this came out... Unless I'm mistaken, it came out on last Sunday, so we're recording this on Friday, May 17th, and this came out, news came out on May 12th, so last Sunday. So obviously, it's a brand new potential exploit. We'll see what happens with that. You know, these old Xbox consoles are kind of getting a little bit dated, and <clears throat> um, 
They're not really for sale. You can't walk into Best Buy and buy them. So it'd be cool to see that console get a second life, kind of like how the original Xbox did. Unfortunately, though, it's it's kind of a double-edged sword. The fact that it runs, it's still getting updated. It's still getting maintained. So it's getting security patches. So Uh who knows, maybe even this could be patched, right? But yeah, it is. It sort of raises questions about when it's appropriate to mod, when it's not appropriate. And I know that the um, so with the Xbox scene in particular, and this is something we we ch- we touched on last time, I believe, is um, kind of the the point of of modding consoles is not necessarily just to pirate games, right? Uh-huh. Like a big a big push is to just experiment and to own your console and to tinker with it and to explore what it can do beyond what it was designed to do. I know that was a big pull for me personally, seeing XBMC for the first time, it was like seeing a magic trick. But that raises the question, with this being sort of a current and supported system, even though it was released now 11 years ago, is it morally sound to hack this thing? Now, me personally, I I know maybe we can open this up and you guys can kind of give your opinions. But I know for me personally, I'm excited about this. I want to see what people can do with this. I'd love to see what, you know, almost like with the Xbox 360, when that was hacked, that allowed you to play more original Xbox games on it. So does this open up other types of games? Like the the original Xbox backwards compatibility library support is very limited. There's only like a couple dozen there when there's eight or 900 titles that exist for the original Xbox. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing with any, I guess, with any exploit. I mean, there's the exploit where people will be like, okay, I want to be pushed the console to the limit. I want to be able to run Linux. Or I want to be able to uh, run my homebrew, but unfortunately, as we've seen with PlayStation as well, any export that comes out, people will then abuse it to do, I guess, the other stuff as well. You know, so right. and and that's something you do want to try to avoid with a current gen console. I mean, it's different for a twenty-three year old console that's pretty much at this stage with OG. You know, the DVD drives are dying. You know what I mean? So if we can do anything to preserve it, which means, you know, having biases that, that you play the games off a hard drive, for example, sure. But with a current-gen console where I can still go online and go into the store and download and play, you know, you get into that area which is like, you know, let's, let's respect that for now. And when it comes to the stage when that console is deemed useless, then sure, it would be great to see what can come out for it. Yeah, it'd be quite cool to see linux pop up on the xbox one someday you can currently load linux onto an original xbox but it's more of a proof of concept because that thing is quite underpowered by today's standards can't really do a whole lot with it yeah what i'll do is i'll reach out to some guys um and possibly for the next show we'll get them on board and 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 see if they can just give us some updates as well and 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 hear the story from there and and we we do also we've been reaching out to folks in the Xbox scene and the extended sort of community, uh, including Xbox 360 and things like that. I just want to say for anyone listening who is interested in participating and becoming a speaker and sharing your story, we do or we will at least have a form that you can fill out that just lets us stay organized and keep track of who would like to speak, and we'll organize a time for you to come on and, and say your part. So we'd love to have you on. And what we're trying to do with this podcast is we like to hear the story straight from the source. So nothing gets you know lost in translation or anything like that. So definitely, if you're interested in joining, please reach out to us via the form, and we'll get you on. Yep. So that form will be. I'll paste that in the description when I post this on YouTube. It'll also be in the description on Spotify when that gets posted, and then we'll also pin a comment on the channel in Xbox Scene, so you can reach out to us by any one of those means. So kind of switching gears and just kind of keeping on the topic of news and new things coming out. So Harcraft, I know you were recently working on a DLC installer. Do you maybe want to let people know about that? What have you been working on? Sure. Uh, with the release of XCAT, there isn't just people running XCAT. I mean, that that's really helpful and great, but people also just checking more hard drives. Um, and that was partly from Mr. Mario's coverage of all the, the DLC and stuff. And then like uh, the previous podcast, people started saying, hey, I ran XCAT because of the previous podcast, which is fantastic. And thank you. Uh, but two uh, members of the community, uh, Scooty Hamster from the Halo Classic Hub, and uh, a well-known act, uh, archivist named Cheeto or Game Cheat, they both provided rosters for NBA Jam, which have been lost for uh, roughly 20 years. And as of right now, Rocky has them and will be able to add them to his downloader at some point. 
I am I'm polishing off the DLC installer for the right right now, and they'll be on digix.net in probably under an hour from from now. So we are finding new DLC and more more title updates with XCAT, and just people in the community seem to be more active looking for stuff again. So if you enjoyed NBA Jam, the Halloween team and the Thanksgiving team will be available very soon. I'm I'm really glad to hear that you guys are getting results for that, and thank you to everyone who has run that tool. To anyone who uh, is kind of tuning in for the first time, uh, if you haven't heard about that, we talked about it a lot in episode one. On that note, a new version of XCAT was recently released. I want to say yesterday, the day before. I don't know the whole list of updates. Maybe Crunch, you could fill us in on what has changed. <laughs> the, the main thing is, it's about 10 times as fast and handles errors better. So everybody gets a better experience. Any uh, any people. cursed C code in there that we should know about? The whole thing's absolutely cursed, and I'm going to hell. You heard it here first. XCAT is haunted. <laughs> uh, Crunch, people. are you able to give us a rough estimate on, say, numbers? Sure, yeah. We've got uh, 300 and something. Sorry, 433 different consoles have run it, and we've got just about a million files archived. Wow. Wow. Not all of those are DLC. So far, I'm just creating the world's largest collection of Xbox game saves, but we're getting there. <laughs> An important note is XCAT is a great way to contribute. But if for some reason you have orphaned hard drives that, you know, old Xboxes you can't get online with or whatever, for whatever reason you can't run XCAT on your, your Xbox, uh, we have people all over the US, Canada, Australia, and Europe uh, willing to take shipments of all original Xbox hard drives they can archive it and you can just give your content to them. And that's actually what happened with Scooty Hamster where he mailed, uh, actually Sky mentioned it last podcast that he mailed a half a dozen or a dozen hard drives to her. And um, so we have one in Canada. Uh, so we have PO boxes you can just mail your, your hard drive to. One in Canada, which is me. Uh, Midwest US, which is Sky. West Coast US with D Tomcat. Uh, the UK, or Greater Europe, with Hizeno, and there's two separate ones in Australia, uh, one in, in Queensland, with, which is Sicta, and one in Victoria, which is Halo Oss. So it's no exaggera exaggeration to say that this is a global effort. That's outstanding to hear that there's been such a response to this. That's really cool. With more people offering to, to take drives and help us out, we are, like, the emphasis right now is very heavily uh, focused on PAL and Japanese you know asia region hard drives because that's what we're missing is mostly pal region content uh north american stuff we have a lot and there's a little bit missing we will need to kind of find those last few things but like if you you're in europe somewhere and you know there's a stash of xboxes or xbox hard drives that's what we're really like i'm i'm really looking for that right now and an important tool we have for unlocking hard drives and just pulling eproms was dtomcats pico prom sd which we briefly talked about last time uh, he's down to two so if anybody wants one, I would contact him now because he will be open sourcing it, releasing it on GitHub. Then you won't have an assembled one. You'll have to have someone assemble it for you. Okay, well, that's that's great. That's great to hear. And like I have a PicoProm SD too. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that being open source. Hopefully that can help with orphaned hard drives and also recovering EPROMs off of consoles. And it's a very useful device. And I look forward to the Tomcat open sourcing that because it's a very, very powerful tool. And I believe Sky was working on something as well from the PC side, unless I'm mistaken. Yeah, lately, touching on what was just said, doing the whole like unlocking of these orphan hard drives has kind of been a huge pain. We'll go more into detail uh, as we're going on, but as of late, we have been working on some things to try and make the process a lot easier and simpler, focusing specifically on the like Western digital drives. There's only two brands of uh, hard drives that come in the original Xbox. There's one from Western Digital, and then there's two different models that come from Seagate. The Westerns, there are a couple different model variations. It's ultimately not that important, but they don't have a serial connection on them that can be accessed with standard equipment. And because of that, the only way that you could unlock them was through connecting it in native IDE onto, like I want to say it was like a Linux distribution that uh, could communicate at a low level in order to dump a firmware module, which would then give you access to the the user password, which is 
different than the HDD key, which most people know, which is what gets extracted out of the EEPROM off of the console itself. There is a process to it, but from what I understand, the HDD key is used in combination with the serial number on the hard drive itself in order to generate this user password, which is the one that's saved onto the drive. Well, either way, we can use some trickery to get that actual user password out of the hard drive itself as it's stored on the platters. It's not stored on the chip, or excuse me, it's not stored on the circuit board like a lot of people think it is, but it's actually stored on the platters itself within the firmware or the service area. But you can extract it and you can actually use that in combination with Fat Explorer in order to unlock the drives and uh, extract their contents, even if you don't have the uh, console itself. We're currently in the process to try and simplify uh, with Westerns because not everybody has access to a computer that has native IDE and not everybody has access or the acumen to use a Linux distribution. It's not for everybody. I'll be the first to say that to pretty much anybody who ever asks me. I, I do have um, a couple of questions. I don't know if you can answer or not. Maybe. Yeah. So something that came to mind is... So when you say native connections, do you know, so obviously that would exclude USB to IDE adapters, but do you know if that would include, like, you can go on to, like, Newegg and buy a, uh, you know, PCI to IDE adapter. So do you have any idea if it's something that has to be, like, natively on the board, you know, on your motherboard? I assume, like, a, a modern IDE adapter would probably work in that case, right? Or is that something you're aware of? So ultimately, you're right. Um, those PCI Express adapters that spit out to a native SATA, or excuse me, a native IDE connection do actually work uh, if you, say, want to use like Linux distribution or anything in particular. That's actually what I use uh, for my own development and my own testing. I have access to hard drive recovery, hardware, because, sorry, data recovery is what I do for a living, but I also, on one of my like secondary or tertiary machines, I have one of those StarTech PCIe to IDE adapters that I use for just like some basic stuff for things that come in. But for my case in particular, for doing testing when it comes to unlocking these drives, it's really handy to have that connection available to me. As well, I don't have super duper low level access. The methods that we are developing will actually work with that. So when I say native SATA, I or native IDE, I basically just mean not USB. But USB okay. will work, I'm hoping, in the future. But for right now, we are developing methods to make it a lot easier to do this on Windows so that you don't have to have Linux. So you don't have to have a, a computer with like, the PCI connection to IDE, you can actually use USB in this case. But what we are no. doing is we're trying to integrate the support eventually into something like Fat Explorer. But for right now, it is being integrated into one of the subcomponents, um, Smart Mon or Smart CTL. It's a command line utility, but uh, going to be doing a batch file to try and make the process a lot easier for everybody involved. I appreciate that Eaton is is in the scene, kind of spending the time to work on this on this old console because that's a, that's a really cool breakthrough that we would have loved to have decades ago. Um, used to be back in the day, if you got locked out of your console and you didn't have the hard drive key, you had to go through quite a few ho quite a few hoops to uh, to get that and to get access to your console again. Another question I I had the vendor service commands is that the term for what you're sending to the hard drives? Effectively, yeah. Um, the In the community, they just call it like vendor-specific commands, but vendor commands vendor are close commands. enough. Okay. I'm just curious, uh, does that put the drive into sort of like a recovery mode, or is that just something you, you, you can send at any time? While it's live and active, you can just send these commands at any time, or does it go into a special, like, you know, almost, I'm almost thinking like with iPhones, you could put in a DFU mode, right? Does it have to go into a special recovery Hi. mode for you to do that? 
it's kind of like that, actually. Uh, when you, it can enter that mode technically at any point in time, but you do have to send a certain command, which sort of acts as like a key command. But once that is sent, acknowledged, and received, it is at that point that you can use then other special undocumented commands in order to access and interact with the firmware. It's what like Western Digital, Seagate, and all the other companies, they develop these all themselves. They just don't publish it and companies reverse engineer it. And they, it gets shared around in circles. Software is developed around it, but nobody really knows this unless you do it yourself and figure it out yourself, which kind of did, kind of didn't. Western's kind of an open secret. Seagate's a lot tougher. At this moment, are there, you mentioned that, there, you know, there's, of course, different vendors and drive types. There's Western Digital and Seagate. So there's obviously drives that are easier to send these commands to and drives that are harder, right? Are there still currently drives that cannot be accessed? And just to clarify and make sure I understand it, you're trying to make the process smoother for certain models of hard drives that don't support sort of the streamlined route that you have for other models. Is that right? More or less. Uh, probably the better way to put it is that with Westerns, you don't have a serial connection. So you can't say like connect up a TTL USB adapter to send commands like with Seagates. Um, that's kind of been known for quite a while. Cheapo adapter, you can just buy it on Amazon. A couple of connectors that plug into where like those jumpers, if anybody remembers having to deal with IDE jumpers, it plugs into a couple of those, sends and receives. You can send some commands and it spits out some output. Um, but with Seagate, that's how you do it. That's how you actually get that password if you don't have it. But with Westerns, you don't have that ability. So you have to send those commands through the IDE bus. Otherwise, you are just kind of SOL. That's great. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that Eaton in, your, in, the, in yourself and I assume more people in that 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 cabal <laughs> um they're working on that that's really cool like um so eaton he's been developing fat explorer for years at this point and it's been it's basically replaced um xbox hdm which is kind of the old school way of building hard drives on a pc you used to have to build boot into linux and uh go through a bunch of hoops and get a deal with the drive being locked and unlocked and accessible by the host operating system and that that was just a big pain so it's it's Tremendous that this is a, and like you were saying, like you can do these things if you're comfortable with Linux, but it's about making them accessible to kind of the general user, which is also a similar theme to XCAT. Pinecone existed for someone who is comfortable with taking apart their Xbox and right. I'm sorry, I've never used Pinecone. I don't. I don't want to misconstrue what it is. Does it connect over FTP? Pinecone works in two ways. The easiest way is just to take whatever files you have on your console and FTP them to your PC or put them in a folder and you tell Pinecone to look at that folder and and all it does is identify what's there, if it's uh, archived or not, based upon a, a database that I maintain. Uh, and the other method is if you have your E drive on your Xbox mounted in Fat Explorer as X, which is when you say mounted drive in Fat Explorer, it defaults to X, you can run Pinecone in Fat Explorer mode and it will just scan that virtual e drive or that mounted e drive that's the only thing it does is that identifies what's there whether it's dlc it, it, what dlc is there what title updates are there based upon a database it's not perfect but it's a really good tool just to say hey there's something here you should look at this yeah so i guess what i was saying, trying to get at is that it's a good thing to uh, make these tools available but it's tremendous to see the extra effort being extended to make it accessible to people who might not be comfortable taking apart their xbox and that accessibility opens up a lot of possibilities. So that's that's really cool to hear. Okay, well, switching gears a little bit, I know I wanted to kind of get into some of the projects you're working on, Rocky, because I'm as a XBMC nerd, I'm kind of fascinated with what you know, any tidbits of information you give me about with what's coming out. I'm, I think we might have mentioned this last time too, but there is also a new version of XBMC that's that's um, that's being worked on by um, what's what's the name? Uh, Nikola Blaif. Yeah, Nikolai, thank you. Yeah, so there's a new version of XBMT coming out that I personally am very excited about experiencing once it comes out. Uh, the current version of XBMC, the vanilla version, has been out since 2016, version 353. And since then, Rocky, you've been kind of 
sort of upgrading and, and enhancing XBMC through your XBMC for gamers as well as um, Emu Station. Basically, yeah. You want me to like, tell you about it? Yeah, pretty much. Just, right. Yeah, I guess if, for people and, who I guess haven't heard about it, um, can you kind of explain what those those projects are? Right. So XBMC for gamers actually started off as XBMC for kids, which was basically just a list, a thumbnail list, a horizontal, where my two daughters couldn't access the settings, they couldn't access anything. It was basically a lockdown version of gamers, essentially. Uh, but it was made for them. And it's the same with the soft mod tool. Uh, when I started that, it was to stop them from breaking their Xbox. So, if, you know, if I didn't have my kids, I probably wouldn't have done any of it. But XBMC for Gamers is basically a nicer looking UI. That's basically what it ended up being. Um, people wanted the kids removed from the name. And as I always pointed out, it was for my kids, so that's why it was called that. But eventually I changed it to Gamers. Um, and since then, it's just evolved into what it is. Uh, the download that I came about, which is part of Gamers, because a guy called Mike Eaton, if he never asked me to do it, it would never have been there. So, you know, there's a few people that have asked for things and eventually it's, in, it's been integrated into XBMC for Gamers. But essentially it's a UI to be clean, or I, let's say eye candy. Um, because I always found most dashboards on the Xbox were limiting. You know, XBMC for Xbox is all great and dandy, but a lot of the views for games and stuff like that were lacking. I mean, you get a thumbnail and that was really it. Whereas the movie library, you had synopsis, you had actor thumbnails, you had fan art, you had all the other stuff. Yeah, the so, XBMC actually pulled from online scrapers, at least back when those scrapers were active. and. Um, not to derail too much, but that's also one of the things that um, um, the Nikolai is working on uh, is making those scrapers work, right? So that's, um, that's cool to see. The scrapers are built in the XBMC. Like on the Kodi side, they're, they're separate. So, you know, they can be maintained outside of the source code. Because uh, I think they're done in Python on Kodi. Um, don't quote me on that. I think that's what it is. But and obviously in XBMC for gamers, they're built into the XB. So they update the URLs and how it pulls stuff and that. You have to update it in the source. Um, mm -hmm. He is doing that, or I think he's doing that, but he's obviously still trying to get most of the stuff ported from the kind of earlier versions of Kodi over to the Xbox. One thing I will say is I just hope he remembers that 64 megabyte Xbox users, there's more of us than there is the 128 megabyte users. Because the XBMC does eat up quite a lot of RAM straight from the get-go. And obviously, the higher the resolution you use, the more memory it takes up. Uh, but yeah, he's updating the scrapers, hopefully. So if he gets all the movie stuff and that integrated over, which he's got most of it, I think, then we should be able to scrape movies again and TV shows and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I do know that he uh, submitted a patch to XBMC and he told Buzz about it. So um, the TV shows thing is apparently an easy fix. You can update that, I think, with an XML file, if I'm not mistaken, or a Python file. And that'll get TV show scrapers working again. And then movies takes a bit extra work. You have to actually build from source using the patches that he's done. But anyways, uh, coming back to XBMC for gamers, just having synopses and synopses, synopsis, I'm not sure what the plural of that is, but... I to have all that, synopsis. Yeah, but yeah, to have all that that content, it sort of reminds me of uh, if anyone in here is familiar with like a, a Aurora dashboard for a 360, where you have all the fancy cover art. It looks like a modern game picker. So XBMT for gamers just is it's almost like a sh I want to say a showpiece, but you know when you say showpiece, that kind of implies that it's only for looking at. But XBMT for gamers also has a lot of extra tools, like Rocky was saying, the the downloader which he's added content to, even specifically the a DLC that Harkoff mentioned earlier, and a lot of other apps and homebrew. So it um, all kind of circles back to the accessibility of these items. They're not just hidden away on someone. You know, you don't have to be a, uh, what's the polite word? A big freaking nerd who never touches grass. <laughs> you don't have to uh, be really in depth on this stuff. And 
I love that the the scene is making this stuff more accessible for people who are just getting into this. Um, the I feel like the accessibility part of this introduces people and gives them a taste and kind of sets them in a direction. So I think that's really cool that all that time and effort is being expended into that. Yeah, uh, Rocky, I know you um you touched bases on on the limitation, um, and you mentioned you know sixty four megabytes of RAM for a retail console. Is there anything in particular that you would have loved to implement into, say, XBMC for gamers or EMU station, but unfortunately, you know, you just hit that roadblock? Well, I'll touch on that in a second. I just want to continue what I was saying regarding gamers. Aurora Dash on the 360, the homebrew Dash, uh, which came after the freestyle Dash, that is, I basically seen that and I thought that was damn nice. It was just, it was square, it was clean. I liked how the menus were laid out. It was simple. You know, it was easy to use. That's where the newer versions of gamers looks kind of similar, where it's got the square menus, it's got the menus down the left, stuff on the right. It's kind of similar. It's got the contextual buttons down the bottom to tell you, you know, what button does what, etc. Um, obviously, I've done more than what the Aurora Dash does um, and because I can do more in XBMC. But before that, it looked, XBMC looked a lot different. Or XBMC for gamers looked a lot different. Um, as for limitations, it's mainly myself. Um, regarding, like, you know, I'm, I'm not really a coder. You know, I'm more persistent. You know, I'm a tinkerer. I learn stuff as I go along. The main problem I have, I use XB. I don't actually use the Xbox to play games or anything like that. I just do the dashboard stuff and the downloader stuff and the soft mod stuff. That's what I like doing. The one thing I would like is better texture management. You know, it unloads textures quicker. So, because the problem is, is I don't know if it's a bug or it's just how it works in XBMC. Um, the source code for XBMCs is it's like spaghetti. You're jumping from file to file to other folders into other files and it becomes a headache trying to track down where stuff's going and what stuff's doing what. Um, obviously, if you worked on the source for the very beginning, you would know. But coming in at a later date when it's done, it, it's a pain in the backside. But I would prefer if textures, especially thumbnails and stuff, could be unloaded and loaded in a lot better. Because right now, I've had to basically put in stop gaps or kind of hacks in a way to stop the black screen icons happening, which basically when your Xbox has zero megabytes of RAM, memory left, thumbnails will no longer load. So you just end up with black icons as you scroll about your dash. It won't crash. You just end up with no icons and your memory will jump back up to 16 megabytes or whatever, but nothing will load again. Uh, so the way around that was basically when your Xbox gets to a certain memory level, so if it gets to 10 megabytes, it then uses ImageLib instead of the Turbo J, uh, JPG or JPEG, whatever it is. That's the XBMC's internal decoder for the images. That's the fastest one. That's what all the small thumbnails use when you're cached. So that's how you can scroll at a maniac and they just load and unload, no bother. It's when you're loading images from the actual hard drive, from external parts of the drive, that it causes issues. And so memory, that's there's mem better memory management is more what I would like. The problem is, is that's above my head. So, Rocky, I, I, I hope, I hope I'm not interrupting. Um, I had a question regarding that. Do you know at about what level that issue happens? So, are you testing on a 64 meg stack console? I assume. Yes. Yes, 128. And, you'll, you'll never see it. Okay. 100, so, 100, 128 megabytes. You can throw whatever the hell you want at it, and it'll just always sit. The lowest I've got 128 megabytes is 40 megabytes left. And I can't get it okay. to go any lower. And that's with high res thumbnails and high res fan art. Um, so it that's, won't go that's not even, for it. So that's not even compressing to a obnoxiously lossy format and crunching your images down. That's at, at 128, well, it, you're pretty much golden as far as with all the artwork that is tried to be displayed. Well, if you've got 128 megabytes, it automatically uses higher res artwork. So when you install the artwork from the installer, it comes with high-res versions of the artwork. 
which are used for the synopsis view. So when you press Y and it brings up the synopsis information, you get uh, like a higher res thumbnail. That gets used instead of the lower res thumbnail for most views. Obviously, views that use specific types of artwork, they just stay the same. But anything that uses the, thumb, like the default poster will automatically use the higher res version. And you won't see any issues on 128 megabytes. Even with the higher res fan app, because you can download that for the downloader and you get you can toggle an option in the artwork and store to use the high res fan art if it's present um, and you'll never see an issue. It's the only issue you would ever see loading artwork from 128 megabytes is it might load slightly slower because obviously the bigger the image, the more it has to transfer into memory before it's displayed. But if you like I use an SSD on my 1.6 and it's you, you did everything loads it's I kind of get back to a mechanical hard drive on it it's just everything loads quicker like scanning in emu station like scanning in ROMs is lightning fast whereas if you do it on a mechanical it can take quite a while um, so but, I guess that I'm, I'm sorry go ahead no I was going to say basically if you're under 28 you don't need to worry it's only 64 megabyte users that they don't need to worry either because I've put stuff in place to stop anything from happening as best I can. It's basically a memory management game, in a sense. But I've done my best to at least get the artwork and the dashboard to look nice without crashing your Xbox because it's ran out of memory. Mm -hmm. So that, that leads to a, a question, kind of something that was mentioned last episode, is that it looks like there is, on the horizon, RAM mods that can potentially increase the Xbox up to 256. So in your opinion, does that open up any new possibilities that maybe come to mind that maybe weren't possible before? I know with artwork specifically, that's nah, that's it's, solved. It's, it's um, going to make zero difference. Works in the XBMC that you might. Okay. Well, I'm not. I, I don't care about the media playback stuff, but the media playback stuff's generally. I don't think XBMC is GPU accelerated. I could be wrong. I don't know. I don't think it is. Um, but the CPU is a limiting factor when it comes to playing media. So it's no memory. It's just the CPU is no good enough to decode newer formats. Really, the memory is only useful for our, like the, how the dashboard looks. But even with 128 megabytes, unless you're loading 36 megabyte PNG files as backgrounds and you've got like six or seven of them, you're never going to have an issue. So memory... The higher, the 256 megabytes of memory, I don't know what's going to use it. Homebrew is obviously going to use it, but, but I, don't, I don't know what purpose it would serve. Uh, Rocky, in so regards to... Something that to, comes to mind... Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, Rocky, in regards to emu station, is, was there any emulator, for example, that you wanted to add into there, but unfortunately it didn't have... Is it a CLI? So when you actually click on a ROM, it, it launches the ROM instantly instead of having to just launch an emulator and then select it through the ROM list? Uh, is there any that I want? The only ones that I wanted were, was RetroArch. Right. Um, because they obviously have certain cores for certain emulators in the Xbox. None of them support the, let's call it, command line um, mm -hmm. launching. Uh, I did contact them on their GitHub, but, you know, they didn't really care. Also, the problem with the RetroArch, I know it's fixed now. I think it's fixed. But on version 1.6, you obviously had the scrambled screen. That had to be fixed. But it was, I, I think, the newest one that was ported by somebody fixed it. But I, don't quote me on that. I don't know. I've not used it. Um, but RetroArch was the one that I wanted. Because I want, MU Station started as me just having a laugh. I just thought, well, I like MU Station, so I'm going to, and I made this crappy carousel with a couple of icons that looked laughable and then a couple of weeks later it looked a bit more like emu station and then it's just evolved into what it is just now but emulator wise i never actually like i said i don't play games um on the xbox so the basic stuff i tested uh so you know obviously mega drive snares stuff like that and most of those emulators that were ported um or updated by MadMap or whatever King that's how you say his name support the command line so for the most popular systems they all work out of the box it's just some of them I had to do workarounds uh, 
Look, me, I had to do a workaround to launch that in the menu. I just edited the source to look for specific files so that it knows to load ROMs for a specific folder or bypass update in the menu system when it loads. So just kind of hacky things to get stuff working. Hacky? And Yeah. Can I ask, uh, so with the Xbox, it does not support multitasking. When an, when an app is loaded, that is the only thing that it has control over the system. Um, so I'm kind of ignorant to this. How, do, how, do, how is that accomplished in the Emu station? Like you were kind of talking about it a second ago. Does it sort of just put the ROM in a folder and launches an XBE that looks for that particular file, or how does that work? That's how the MAME emulator works. So I edited the source to remove all the menu systems. So if, so when, for instance, in MAME, um, before it used to be what I call a direct launch emulator. So it would tell you on the bottom where it tells you on the carousel, it will tell you the how many games you've got for that system. If it's a system that doesn't support command, that doesn't support launching the ROMs from the dash, it will then tell you, it will say direct launch. So with MAME, I patched the source and modified the source to essentially look for a specific file. If it does, it bypasses all the menu stuff because every time you load the menu, it scans a file, which then loads all the menu system. I bypass all that and load the ROM directly, which is in a specific folder, but also tell it what ROM it is as well, so that it loads properly. The other emulators, the ones that support the command line, they put a special code, or a special title ID uh, in a certain part of RAM. So like when you load trainers and stuff, they're stored in memory somewhere which the game doesn't overwrite, but I think Halo 2 uses most of the RAM, so that's why you need to use like, the yellow trailer and, uh, trainer and stuff like that for that. But it's a special command, and when the emulator loads, it looks for it and says, right, it's there. And it's also got the path to the ROM, so it knows that this special keys, this special code, let's say, is there. Run this code to launch this path, which is what the path is, is what, ROM you've pointed it to um, and it will just automatically load it headless so it looks as if you're just pressing A and it boots into the game uh, that and, also and works you say you're not a you say you're not a coder <laughs> no I, I didn't code that into the emulators that's stuff that somebody else done um, right right I'm just saying so like, there's still I'm quite just, a bit of technical work that goes into that yeah 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 I'm just utilising the stuff that was put in place because uh, a lot right, right. Of, it used to it used to be it's mainly XBMC that uses it. Um, I'm can I'm not sure if other dashboards can launch ROMs that way, but XBMC uses what they call cut files, which is basically just shortcut file. And basically, all that is is it basically just tells when you press A on whatever this cut file is, and it will show up as an entry in a uh, in the menu, just like a game. It will run that, and it will check certain fields. It's just an XML file, and it will check the certain fields for the path to the emulator, the path to the ROM, and that's basically it. It will load, it will then do its stuff in the source, pack, put a thing in, in memory, and when the emulator loads, it checks that part, goes, okay, I'm going to load this ROM at this path, and it does it. It's the same, same way it kind of does dashboards, how your dashboard is kind of stored in memory. You know, when you IGR, right. it automatically loads your dashboard back. XBMC does that. So what happens is when you press A and the MU station, I quickly write a cut file to attempt to one of the cache partitions and then launch it. So it happens in like a second, you don't notice. Um, so what I'm doing is just writing the path to the ROM, the emulator, and it just runs it. You can also, when you use the shortcut system to launch a ROM, you can do an IGR and it will take you back to whatever previous dashboard you were in. But that has to be put in you have to tell the emulator to do that as well. So you have to put the path to the previous dashboard in memory. XBMC it doesn't work properly. It will do it once. And then if you load another ROM and you try and do it again, it will just reboot your Xbox to whatever your dashboard does. It doesn't work more than once. So i just done a workaround with Dash Launcher. So when you press A and you've got the setting enabled, it will write a file to the cache folder on E. And Dash Loader just looks for that, and if it finds it, it reloads wherever your dashboard was. So you can have it act like Emulation Station, even if Emulation yeah. is in your dashboard. 
because it did my head in having to get, it would load back into gamers and I'd need to load back into Amy Station. So that's way it just makes it seamless. But that's a toggle yeah. you can toggle under the UI settings. Hey, Rocky. So, uh, and it's, it's kind of working around some of the limitations of, of the original Xbox. It's quite clever. Well, it's, it's worked around some of the stuff that I couldn't work out how to fix. So if it doesn't work, if I can't fix it one way, I don't ask for help. So I don't come to people and go, I can't do this. Can you help me? I'll just try and work it out myself. Um, and if I can't, I'll come up with a workaround. Right. What were we saying, Harcraft? Uh problem people were having with Dashler customizer is that it natively runs in 480p and people couldn't figure it out. I went in your files and found it. It's not documented, but you can change your resolution in Dashler customizer by pressing Y, then uh, it brings up a menu, then you press white. It's not documented anywhere, but it's something I think we should add, to, you should add to the documentation or just tell people about because people have uh, been on Insignia complaining about being able to un unable to use Dashler customizer. I didn't even know you could do that. Pressing Y it just brings up the calibration screen where you can resize it to your screen. And then you press white and it'll switch between resolutions. Ah, I didn't know that. <clears throat> um, that's not in the config file. So that's undocumented because I didn't know you could do that. It's in the config file where I found it. Oh, so it's actually in the, key, the gamepad. Well. I'll find it and I'll show you later. Right. I can add a, an overlay to it, but I'd, it's. What do you mean it's loading in 480p? People who have a 480, uh, 480i display and they're using component? Ah, um, they can hold. Oh, I don't know if I added that in. I'll, I'll tell you, but it's something to mention so people understand it because it doesn't seem to be a known feature that it's actually a pretty helpful feature. XPMC, because that's what it basically is, it's just XPMC with all the stuff. It should default to whatever resolution their system's set to. Um, it shouldn't be loading into like a different resolution. They must have 480p enabled on the system for it to boot to 480p, even if they're on a 480i system. The point is so, we found a fix. Yes, you could also probably, like with gamers and stuff like that, I made it so that if you hold X and B, when it's starting up, it will disable all resolutions. Don't know if that's part of dash loader. I don't know if I put that into that. Uh, no dash loader, the customizer. Because um, that's I know as people were having issues with gamers who were putting it to on a CRT. Um, yes. If I can interrupt for just a sec, just in case we have any listeners that are unfamiliar with some of these terms, I just wanted to explain real quick. The so dash loader, I feel like, is an underutilized app. And just kind of give a quick overview. Dash loader is sort of like a quick launch tool that you can use. You make it your default dashboard basically when you're booting up your Xbox and you can hold a certain button. So let's say you hold A on your controller and you can boot into XBMC. You hold B on your controller while you're booting up and it boots into XBMC for gamers. You hold X, it boots into Unleash X, hold Y, whatever it may be. So I just wanted to explain that real quick for anyone who's unfamiliar. So Dash Loader allows you to quickly boot into a different dashboard. You can even hold you know, Y, for example, and you can customize it using the, the customizer app. And um, you could hold a certain button to boot into a different XB, uh, XBE. So just wanted to explain that real quick. But sorry, go ahead. Just to touch on that, if you're running the Xbox soft mode until you've already got it, um, yeah, so anyone, and that's a very popular tool. Anyone who's soft modding recently in the past few years probably already has that. If you're not using Dash Loader, it'd be a great tool to use. Uh, heaven forbid something goes wrong with your current dashboard and it crashes. That's at least a method to hold a certain button on your controller to boot into a recovery dashboard even. And that works even on a soft mod console if you don't have a mod chip to boot into to recover your console. So Dash Loader can kind of can kind of save your butt in those moments where you might get locked out. Yeah, um, and Rocky, you, I also, what were we going to say? I was going to say, if you hold back and Y together, it'll load a recovery menu. So awesome. Well, on the soft mod, there's, when you soft mod your system, there's three recovery menus, or dashboards, let's say, because that's what they all are, installed. There's one on the hidden C partition, or the real C partition, and there's two. Uh, there's one in U data and T data. So if you wipe your E partition your C partition, your F, you wipe your drive by accident, you can just hold back in Y and it'll load into the last recovery dash, which will let you re-soft mod your Xbox. I try, I try and make it as 
stupid it proof. Let's put it that way. I try and make it as dumb proof as I possibly could. Well, uh, it's almost like an arms race. <laughs> you make it harder to break, and someone will figure out a better way to make it <laughs> to actually break it. Well, as far as my well, way, it broke it. Proof. <clears throat> That's what it started out. So yes, yes, it was kid proof. Uh, dashboard dash loader wasn't a thing then when I done the twenty fourteen soft mode. Dash loader wasn't part of that. That came later on. But essentially, yes, it was like the shit, the real C partitions never exposed. So you know, if you load the extras disk, you can't access the real C partition um, because it doesn't use a bit from media BIOS. Um, you can access the real C partition if you load, like you disable the shadow, shadow C. So if you go to advanced settings and go down to uh, advanced, so I can't remember what it is. It's been a long time since so I looked. But in one of the settings, you can disable the shadow C partition and it'll ask you a few times, are you sure? If you do this, don't come to me complaining, basically. But the way I do that is Unleash X is patched to look for a different partition. So it doesn't look for C, it looks for partition 14, which is the the either the shadow partition or the real one. So that's how I can hide C from dashboards and show it if I need to. So the like NK patcher settings can see the real C partition, but no other dashboard can. Well, um, I, I did want to, not to conclude too quickly, but I did want to move on to some other topics. But I had, I had one question for you, Rocky. Um, you, you said earlier you don't really know what it could be currently used for. But just kind of throwing it out there, are there any any ideas you could have as what you could possibly use ex- additional RAM for besides cover art? Anything that like a 256 megabyte RAM upgraded console could be used, you know, beneficial for the kinds of things that you do? For me personally, no, I can't think of anything. Um, yeah. 128 megabytes is obviously I'm catering to the lowest denominator, so I have to up to 64 meg 128 does everything anybody anybody needs so i'm not entirely sure what 256 would be used for unless well, you're loading I'm, huge huge things into rat and the memory I, I don't know I, I have no need for it for the stuff i do i have no need i guess time Eat. i guess time to talk yeah, but there's another important it. point about dash loader that that people don't talk about, and people on Insignia especially complain that they they can't get the stock feel, look and feel of the Xbox if they mod it. Dash loader customizer is how you do that. Now that's a great point. Like if you're booting up with dash loader, you can hold either make it your default dashboard, and you get that stock experience. Your boot screen looks the same, and then you boot up into a dashboard that looks exactly the same. It, it is the same dashboard as the original Xbox had. Or you can use UIX Lite, just a little point there. Uh, UIX Lite mm-hmm. is very similar to the original Xbox feel, but it adds additional tools that someone who has monitored their console may take advantage of. And you get an FTP server in the background, and it's, it's useful. But yeah, I'll good just, point, Harcraft. So, yep. I'll say if you want to get the stock look, all you need to do is if, say you're running the soft mod tool, if you want the stock look with the backup of being modded. All you have to do is load NK patch or settings, change your LED under the LEDs menu to green, reboot the Xbox, install dash load customizer, and under the override dash, there'll be an option down the bottom and in, in the center underneath the big control pad. It says override dash. Put that to C Xbox dash. And then any of the other buttons you can set to whatever other dashboard you want to load. So the override dash will always load to that. That overrides every other dash path that's in dash loader. If it doesn't exist, so if you, it gets corrupted or deleted one day, it'll automatically fall back to another one. But then you can just change one of the other buttons, one of the face buttons to whatever other dash. So if you want to load into gamers one day to download stuff, set it as B. And then when the Xbox is loading, just hold B in. Install your stuff and then restart and you'll be back at the original dashboard with a green LED because I know a lot of people go why is it yellow or orange how do I get it green and why is my why is my LED blue uh, <laughs> <laughs> I got the blue ring of death plus all my controller ports are also they also have the blue ring of death I don't know what that means I guess I guess this will be a perfect time to actually introduce uh, one of our next guests and you're probably quite familiar with him Rocky um, from back in um 
I'm guessing Team Black Bolt days. So that will be Equinox. Hey, hey there. Yeah, as uh, Hag said, um, yeah, w- me and Rocky worked back together many years ago when we probably both had hair. Um, <laughs> Actually, no, 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 I had some, I had some, some, some. Yeah. Um, I actually was a fan of the MC three sixty sort of what progress, um, the skin that gave the blades feel to uh, XBMC, and I entered the competition as it were and before i knew it i became team black bolts coder <laughs> writing tools for rocky and everyone else and doing yeah, xp himc cool. programming yeah all sorts the, the, the blade dashboard was infamous yeah the slanted, the slant for what was it oh crap what was the name of that the next skin i done we are counter oh god i know um experience Experience, yes. When I kept having to do that stupid slanted view manually, and you made a wee tool for me, just done it. And it was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then, um, so then we did uh, the ellipsis skin, which was a lot of it, programming stuff for XBMC because it didn't have the features that we needed. So it was like, okay, I can create that and the stuff we did. And also after that, I sort of left the xbox scene and i then worked on freestyle dash which um scotch mentioned earlier so i was one of the coders on that and i was out of the scene probably like nine years and i came on to the discord uh, of xbox scene i was basically just looking for some xdk files and i i mentioned that i was I did stuff for Team Black Bolt and, uh, you know, the uh, Phoenix team. And, you know, Hager messaged me and reeled me back into the OG scene. So... I guess you're no stranger, right? You've been you, you've been around since, I guess, day one. Um, yeah. Starting off with OG and then for the people that don't know, Freestyle Dash was a, a dashboard replacement for the 360. So you've tinkered with both systems... I guess yep. the question I have is, do you have a favourite system? Um, I'm addicted to OG at the moment. <laughs> that is the correct answer. <laughs> correct. Give him 10 points. He did it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I've, I've got like seven OGs who do different configurations that I like to tinker with. Like Prometheus has now taken over my life and I've got an unhealthy... Um, addiction to OLED displays at the moment. So I've just been, every time I see a different type of OLED display, I've been buying it and pasting what I've just recently bought onto the have you, channel. <laughs> so do you have a OLED in your, your current development? Ex- your, no. Your well, Xbox, well, or my, my, well, my Xbox, the lid's been off of it for God knows how many years now. <laughs> <laughs> the hard yeah. drive sitting on the side of the desk. There's wires hanging out all over the Real place. Real pros don't have an assembled Xbox. Okay, yeah, yeah, let's, yeah. let's be clear. Nope. Or you get like those, uh, you know, like with tuner cars, you get those pins that you pop out real quick. <laughs> yeah, so um, until Prometheus, I never had a display or anything like that. And I guess actually having the experience of like programming for it, it sort of made me realize, you know, how sort of, stuck in the way that we are of the types of displays that we have to use i.e it's like the dash that knows it has to be like a two row or four row by 16 or 20 characters and just tells the display to display this character at a certain point so you know i wanted to turn that on the head and actually do it so the application just sends details to the display but the display then decides how to to um render it so i'm guessing with with prometheus being being open source and i guess with a whole team research i think where you know we we try to push as much open source as we can uh this is something that people would be able to i guess utilize and implement into to dashboards because i'm assuming like Xbox yes C, for example won't natively support it right so yeah these drivers would need to be 
I guess, added in. But then with that being said, that's the beauty of, of open source, right? Because XBMC is there and, you know, whether it's Tim Resurgent or Nicola or someone else can go in and say, okay, let's add support to one of various LCDs, right? Yeah, yeah. And I, I've been creating libraries of everything I'm doing and it's all open source. So, you know, once I've got this way of doing things all, you know, fine-tuned and everything, then you know, I'll make sure that, you know, XBMC has those features, you know, Prometheus and so on. And, you know, everyone can, you know, use it as however I've done it or modify to their own will, as it were. Nick, when I, yeah. I, have, a requ- I have a request, can you make the... The LCD screen show my high score in Snake while I'm playing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, with the two player and whatever, but yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, the uh, insignia support, yeah, the it, it, player it's insignia support. support. <laughs> yeah, so I, 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 yes. So go on. No, I was just going to say, yeah, I seem to be like this person that just likes to make work for themselves. So yeah, I'll. You just say, and I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the questions we usually get asked, being part of the scene, is what initially actually drew you into the scene, or specifically the Xbox Xbox platform, to do homebrew on it? Well, yeah, for me, I'm like in my 50s now, but I, I started with an interest in sort of computers when I was like eight years old. And I started off, I I wanted to be a programmer. I started to learn to program. I had a book on Z80 Assembler. And for some reason, I learned Assembler, not from the mnemonics, but actually from their decimal values. And I only knew enough basic to type in those decimal values. And I was coding in basically Assembler first. And that got me to then, when I was like in my teens, to then join the Amiga scene. And I was like a you know demo maker and doing all sorts of things on that. Did you come out of the womb running? Like did the yeah. have to like catch you? <laughs> yeah, it must have been. Uh, but yeah, then uh, after the Amiga scene, I did for my work. I was a military of defense, building missiles and stuff like that. But I never wanted to be like electronics engineer. I still wanted to be a programmer. So I positioned myself to eventually doing sort of the programming jobs. And that's where, you know, things like XBMC and stuff like that was starting to, you know, come about. And, you know, I just enjoyed doing all sorts of, you know, trying to make the hardware do more than what it was sort of designed to do. So, I have a question in terms of like working on on homebrew and stuff for the original xbox can you give us some insight or talk about like how much of that was knowledge that you had to find out for yourself like almost like with sky on her her hard drive endeavors where she had to go you know some of it was like stuff she had to kind of figure out right how much of this was stuff you had to go figure out versus information you could pull from a knowledge base or community like so, can you kind of give an idea of how the, the difference between that so when i first did any xbox coding which would have been like xbmc coding I knew no C sort of programming. I had probably about four days from a college course that I had done, but I just was probably probably from my younger experience of just programming full stop. You know, I, I was able to grasp what I was doing and looking through the code, I could see the patterns and I can't remember what was there before the internet. <laughs> I will, uh, I, yeah. On that note, can I ask a question? What was like your first where you consider a programming task that you had? Maybe like in your early days, like what, what would you consider to be your first like programming, you well, know, uh, thing that well, you did for what, uh, whatever it may be? Yeah, well, when I was nine, I think, no, it was probably 10. I did stuff like I, on a Sinclair Spectrum, I copied the code that would load from tape into memory and I managed to change all the timings and I did my own turbo loader. And then I'd also do it on a Sinclair Spectrum. You'd see when it was loading the, the screen, you'd see it drawing in a certain way, but I customized it so it would draw in a fancy pattern like the Commodore 64 did. So that was my probably earliest achievement. <laughs> so, sorry, just to clarify, you said 
when you were 10 years old, right? Yes. Nine or right, ten, yeah. roundabout. Isn't yeah. ca- like so yeah. cassette tapes? When you say tapes, yes. like cassette tape. Ooh, <laughs> yeah, I came. In, I came in at the floppy age, so <laughs> yeah. yeah you, you'd wait fifteen minutes to uh, load a game or something like that, or if you wanted to back up a tape, you'd have one cassette player in in the room and then another cassette player recording because they didn't have like the leads to go from one cassette player to the next and you cl- carefully shut the door but if your your mum walked upstairs and made a noise or something then you would have to redo the recording Wait, it's an open air microphone yeah it, like at my age we had we recorded you know stuff off the radio on a cassette tape so you're just like out there just live mic in the room yeah. for comp yeah for, uh, yeah. Sinclair P- code? Pump it, yeah pumping the volume up playing like the modem noises like you hear on pandora when it uh you connect and yeah you, you just have to be very quiet yeah and if you wanted there was different ways of loading games there was like you could have a, a light that flashed so like a couple of hundred times a second and that would be a way of loading data let's just say when we had a floppy drive <laughs> we were happy yeah <laughs> did you ever did you ever have a zip drive though those were the those were like oh, bentley's those yeah. came after floppy drives <laughs> right right but like that was like a like floppy those... drive on steroids yeah what about what about you, Rowdy? What was your first sort of programming endeavor as a youngin? The first thing I ever did was, which is going to be funny because you guys keep talking about that snake game, was in high school <laughs> or, yeah, in high school, I, I wrote a snake game from scratch. And I grew up in a small town in the Midwest, and everybody back then thought computers were stupid, you know what are you messing around with that stuff for and all that stuff? Well, yeah, we went through the VIC-20. I remember the stupid tape drives and somebody come and bump it. You'd be starting all over. It took forever to load your stuff. So your first project was copyright infringement? Cloning Snake? <laughs> oh, so it didn't exist. It's, it's, it's a snake you find on your Nokia phone now. It was actually written by Rowdy. Oh, yeah, he's the original coder <laughs> they stole from yeah. you. You, you well, because they gave like us a, a project in school. We're talking, what was it, basic Pascal or assembler was our choices that we learned by then. We only had an Apple II. I mean, it's not like we had anything special. And it was like green screen. We thought we were impressed when we got color monitors. I mean, remember when we just, well, a lot of you guys probably don't, but Equinox will, when yeah. we just had monochrome monitors when we got our first color monitor was like oh shit i can change my stake to change yeah. different colors and shit yeah. now i'm like high tech right yeah. and then you're thinking when the 3d came out which was like the monochrome 3d and stuff like that and you're thinking well this is it and everything can now look at 3d now <laughs> i mean my getting involved with video games was when I was young, my parents wouldn't let us have them. We we couldn't have a console. So I'd have to sneak over to a friend's house. My friend had a Commodore 64. Somebody had, I don't know, some... Atari? No, that starts with an O. Uh, Odyssey? Maybe it was the Odyssey. Oh, the, the old, old, like the Magnavox? Old, yeah, Magnavox Odyssey? Yeah. So some kid had one of those. One had an Atari, you know. So... You had to sneak over so you could play. So when I got out of high school, I went into the military. So my first paycheck, when I wasn't going through basic training and all the other stuff, I bought my first Nintendo with Excite Bike and Donkey Kong and crap like that. And so I blame my parents for the reason my addiction to video games. But uh, it just went on from there, from Nintendo. And I had the Apple II. And, you know, they were talking about how we had user group with the Amiga group. And they had Apple II user groups. I remember loading that stupid Apple with the monitor and my disk drive and all that stuff going to what they called user groups. But back then, there was no copyright. Heck, most of the people didn't even know what computers were back then. And as a high school kid, didn't have a lot of money. So 
Yeah, yeah I, I think a lot of the a lot of the modding that I did on in the original Xbox in the, in my early days personally was done as the result of me not being able to afford a mod chip. That's why I soft modded. I didn't really pirate too much, but I wanted to explore XBMC and stuff like that, right? But I feel like if you don't have the money for those, like a Pico Prom or a um, USB to IDE adapter and all that kind of extra stuff, it, it makes you sort of creative, I'll say. It, it puts you in a box in a box because you're already working in a box when you're working in an, a lockdown system like the Xbox. And uh, there's a lot of creative ways that you can get outside of those boxes nowadays. Well, I think going from all the other consoles, which every console had a scene, you Back when there was BBSs, that was the Super Nintendo stuff. And then you had Nintendo 64, and they had their stuff. But, you know, I swore to God, after the Dreamcast and the PlayStation 2, okay, these are my last consoles, I'm done, right? And then the Xbox came out, and I ended up going to CES um, for work. And what did they have there in the lobby? A damn Xbox playing Halo. I actually went back to the hotel. My boss goes, oh, you want to go to gamble? I said, nah, I'm tired. I'm going to bed. I was upstairs calling the cab to take me to a Walmart to go buy an Xbox because it was launch wow. night. And and Bill Gates I, was standing there and he handed you the Xbox. <laughs> yeah, he didn't hand me the Xbox. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and that's what started it is just what could we do with it is what started. I mean, the main thing is you know we had we talked about this last time is that 32 wire mod chip you know you couldn't get that many so you had one and and then by that time i had a couple xboxes and so i started out doing the xbox save manager with uh keith s and a couple other guys and you know we just evolved that and Rocky pointed out that if someone wouldn't ask him about the downloader part of it or another part of XBMC, he would have never done it, right? And it's the same thing is, you know, you're working on something and somebody comes along and says, oh, that's pretty cool. But what if we did it this? Because I got multiple Xboxes and you're only thinking about one Xbox. Well, I got three Xboxes. So how do I get saves off of all three Xboxes? And how can I identify all three of those Xboxes, you know? And it was just little things like that that just kept involving the projects. And that's kind of the same thing with how Quicks and Avalanche evolved was, um, I'm just going to call him JJ. JJ and I were working on ISO tools and uh, TJ and Blaze and LYS were working on an FTP. And I was like, oh, that's be really cool if the FTP's run the Xbox and we're doing the ISO tool. If we could talk to that FTP, we could transfer right to the Xbox. That's what put the two together. And then TJ just basically said, hey, do you guys just want to join us and we just make one project together? And we're like okay that sounds cool and that's kind of how we started working together and probably so time guess- for another story is how the names came about and all that stuff but that's how we originally first started it was two different projects but you saw how those two projects related to each other and could make each project each side better you know the stuff on the xbox make it better with the stuff that we we're doing from the iso tools but yeah, I'm guessing that was a formation, I guess, of uh, Team Avalanche. But talking about Avalanche, that probably was, along with XBMC at the time, probably would have been one of the most used dashboards available back then. I mean, yes, we did start off with Evo X. And what was that, right? That was just like, almost like a basic launcher. Um, and it wasn't until uh, Avalanche came in or XBMC before we started getting the additional well, features. XBMC of, you know, wasn't even XBMC when we first started. It was XBMP. No. That's right. Xbox Media which, Player. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that was Runtime and all those guys, which eventually became XBMC. But back in the day, we shared code with each other. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, if you use this part of our FTP to get, like, boost mode. So then if you're running an XBMC system... You could still use Quicks with it and still get the same speeds that we were getting with Avalanche if you use the boost mode, you know. So 
that was one thing. The auto detect was another that we gave to everybody. Hey, if you guys run this, then any Xbox can auto detect each other and it makes it easier for us to find them. Um, Rowdy, I have a question regarding that. You mentioned boost mode a few times. What is that specifically? Boost mode was in the FTP and Avalanche, we had something, it was a boost mode. So when Quicks would talk to an Avalanche Xbox, it would kind of go into boost mode. It's more like a caching. So how we cached it so we could get the fastest speeds that we could when we were transferring from a PC to the Xbox. And you got to remember back then, we were 10, 100, you know, if you were lucky, you know, it's not like we had gigabit switches at the time. We were working with 10 megabits, maybe a hundred megabits, right? At least we and weren't so. on DSL or like a uh, dial up, throwing some shade on the PS2 side of people. What <laughs> up? We got Ethernet 10, 100. Well, well I wasn't dial up, okay? That's what we had back then. So the boost mode, what that let you get up to what? 11 megabytes or something. I mean, that's as fast as I've ever seen my Xbox go. I know, I know in an XBMC for some reason it limits it, or it, it, maybe that is that in regular mode when you're transferring over uh, through XBMC because I only see it get at like six or eight megs a second. The UI causes that. So see if you have a black screen with nothing, the FTP is quicker. Okay, I guess that makes sense. Uh, you, okay. you won't get you won't get 12 megabytes, but you get I get about maybe. Oh. Nine ten uh, on gamers, but I, I assume it's because XBMC is constantly writing to the log file, so it's writing at different parts of the platter. So the log file, I mean, it, it doesn't write like a tremendous amount, at least. I mean, I would be surprised if that it, it's it's doing something that causes it not to look for that. Maybe it's rendering the it, UI faster. I don't know. It's, it's using cycles for that. I, I'm speculating here, but. It's just- it's a lack of threading on on the OG Xbox, or I guess code optimization. Um, that well, see on the quick things. side, the quicks is also using your PC cache and is pushing it to the Xbox as fast as it can. But the problem is, is that we can read it at the time. We could read it faster than the Xbox could read it, right? So we're reading from the ISO faster than it could read on the xbox so what we were doing is we were caching it on the pc side and so it let the xbox catch up so we could read it as fast as we want and we could send it as fast as we want but it was you know using the cache and using boost mode to get the maximum speed between sending it from quicks to the xbox what was your um or what was the thought process because with Avalanche, it sort of did push the boundaries. I mean, okay, yes, you had the FTP and Quicks um, support, but then you also had Downloader in there. You had an IRQ or IRC uh, client in there. It did For push, chatting? Push the Is that right? Yeah. You could chat yeah, on Avalanche? And, yeah. Mm-hmm. Really? I didn't know that. Okay. You could check, connect to an IRC server and you could, well, which... Really, we wanted to connect to the ones that we were on, and then you could actually talk to the Xbox One, the Avalanche One, the Avalanche. Well, Avalanche had three IRC channels, so it just depended on which ones you were allowed to be in. But yeah, you could talk through it. And then stream music had- on there. Um, we had the telephone chat or the voiceover IP chat, I guess you want to call it. Um, XLIC support, right? Yep, that was built in. And that's where the downloader came from because we were working with the, at the time, the Rainbow Six guys was who was we were doing it before. You mentioned that you shared code uh, amongst everyone back in the day. I guess the whole scene was pretty open with each other. Um, how important was that collaboration? Like, within the homebrew community. And can you share anything or a notable collaboration that you yourself or your team were a part of? I think the big thing was, is, um, I mean, we were doing, oh, those are some nice Xboxes. Um, you know, we were doing stuff that we, <laughs> we wanted to, to write. Yeah. Um, 
And just like the XBMP guys, XBMC guys, you know, we are their fans too. We like their stuff too. I mean, just like they used our stuff, we use their stuff, right? And I think the collaboration was just, it really wasn't a competition. It was more of, oh, wow, that's cool. They did that. That's pretty cool. You know, we had our list of stuff that we wanted to do. And we were just knocking them off one at a time. Or, you know, like the voice thing came out of nowhere. It's like, hey, what if we could talk over this? Oh, yeah, we could do that. You know, and next thing you know, we tried it. And and then it depends who got the hair up their ass um, to <laughs> we'll go to that, the extreme, worry. right? And, you know, like... TJ's like, I'm going to get this down so low that it's going to sound better than a cell phone. And then back then, cell phones sounded like shit. But, you know, still, it's better than having to call someone halfway around the world and paying, you know, $100, $200 if you wanted to talk to them for any amount of time. We were doing it free over the Xbox. Yeah. Um, I think we talked about that the last episode is um, we had somebody in Australia, which was Lantis. And then I was in California, and then JJ was in the Midwest, and then TJ was in Norway. And here you're, I mean, we talked for probably six hours, you know, just bullshit and talking. You have another Xbox running the music in the background. You could hear somebody just playing their music. Um, hopefully, we're all streaming the same stations at the time. But even back then, streaming music was not a thing. And here we're doing it on Xbox, you know. I was listening to a Norway radio station from California <laughs> on an Xbox. And um, on the last episode, well, after the last episode, you did mention some stuff, and we thought we'd just touch bases on it now, where you did play, I believe you said was Halo, with the Bungie devs, if I was correct? or on custom maps. Can you elaborate on that by any chance? So we got invited after we released Avalanche. So was that 2003? So it was about a year after we released Avalanche. Um, We got invited to go to Norway, and it was a thing called The Gathering. It was like 5,000 people came to play Counter-Strike. It was a big Counter-Strike tournament. And so they invited us. Somehow, TJ and some of the other guys over in Norway knew the promoters of this. And so they invited us to come talk about Avalanche and what we did to all these Counter-Strike people. Well, it happened to be Microsoft was there. So Hilzel, he was a big uh, Halo modder back in the day. He did the Halo maps, projects, and stuff like that. So he decided to make some custom Avalanche maps for us. And he gave it to us before we went over to Norway. And so we had him with us, you know, and we all took our Xbox laptops, all that other stuff. So somehow also Microsoft was there. And so what they did was, so it was like a three or four day event. So the third day, that's when they had us talk, which is completely funny because they all got shit faced at Pepe's Pizza and I had to stay the night and watch all of our equipment so Microsoft would never uh, sneak in and grab any of our laptops or anything because they would always be, we'd always find them looking over our shoulders whenever we're doing something there. So, of course, I got nominated to talk. Well, I don't speak Norwegian, so I'm just going to speak English. <laughs> Hopefully, everybody understands me. Um, they were all hammered. And the next thing I know, we're getting told that we're playing Microsoft against Halo. And I was like, okay. So we had the custom maps. So I said, all right, well, we're going to put these up. So we used our Xboxes because Microsoft couldn't run custom maps on their Xboxes. And so then uh, here we are on stage playing. And here's in the sky in Halo because, you know, of course, we had to show off that the maps had the Halo logo, the Avalanche logo in it and stuff. And so we showed it. We'd point our guns up to the sky so you could see the Avalanche logo in the sky. And then our guys were the blue guys and we had Avalanche logos on our backs. Yeah, we ended up beating them. But after we beat them, 
some of the Microsoft guys came over to our area and said, hey, do you think we can get a copy of that Halo? And we're like, yeah, right. <laughs> you can't play it. And they go, oh, yeah, we can. We we have modded Xboxes at home, too. I was like, okay. Yeah, you can talk wow. to TJ about that one. I'm not. I'm not handing you anything. <laughs> so what's the, I mean, people think, oh, you know, it's taboo, right? It's taboo to mod your console and do this. And you know, you're at this convention with Microsoft people. Did you have that fear inside yourself thinking, oh, shit, these guys at any moment can, excuse the French, come and fuck us and take away our shit? Or did that not cross your mind at the time? We were worried about them taking our stuff. We we're more worrying about them looking at our code, you know, because we were still actually working on Avalanche and Quicks while we were at the thing. We were making updates. I think we did a launch uh, or a release after or while we were at the show. Um, mm-hmm. And so we were more worried about them looking at our stuff or taking one of our laptops or PCs or something. I mean, because we had a lot of equipment there. Did you have any like mod? So like, were your Xboxes special? Did you have like big hard drives back then? You know, like was that a commodity? So we, well, so the big thing then, because you know the U.S. didn't get crystals, so we were in Norway, and so ahead of time, we told TJ, hey, hey, you know, you guys can get the crystals. You know, get us the crystals, and uh, so they got all of us got a crystal. And we all took a day and we did, I got, um, oh, I can't remember the guy's name. But at the time he used to make um, jewels for everybody. And uh, he made us really special avalanche jewels for all of our crystals. And so, you know, we did all those. And so those were the Xboxes that we took to that zero was the ones that we modded over there. And they were all the crystal systems. So they they looked badass by default. Yeah. So that was how I got my first crystal was over in Norway. I'm, I'm I'm quite shocked. I mean, at the end of the day, I guess it came down to like a mutual respect, right? So that Microsoft probably from day one knew what was going on, but it was like, you know what, we'll respect you and what you do, and in turn we'll respect your terms and conditions with what I guess will get published or made available. Um, the fact that you know you and the team Avalanche guys had the opportunity to play against uh, them in arguably one of the best Xbox games to date—that's just impressive itself. Oh, and it's funny. Later down the road, you know, I was at um, GDC in in Redmond, and I think I talked about this on the last episode. Is or maybe I told it to somebody else, but I was outside having a cigarette, just talking to some other guy, you know, talking about Xbox crap, right? Because there's GDC about Xbox, really. And uh, we just happened to be talking about Quicks. And so some Microsoft guys were walking out to have a smoke, and, you know, we're talking about Quicks and stuff. And they go, oh, we know what that is. And I'm like, how do you know what it is? Oh, we use that all the time. I'm like, you use Quicks all the time. You're Microsoft. Why don't you use your own tools? Oh, because yours is faster. <laughs> Why? Because it has boost mode? <laughs> <laughs> well, evidently it was faster than the tools they had. I mean, this comes down to personal opinion, though, but does it sometimes feel that, in a way, Microsoft sort of helped build the scene to what it is today? I think Microsoft saw the creativity that was coming out of the scene, but they didn't have to pay for it. Because, I mean, was any of us selling it? No, we were posting it online. They could download it just like anybody else, right? I don't know if we wanted to talk about this story, but, like, when they took the Xbox up to Redmond, right, the modded Xbox that had Avalanche, XBMC, some emulators on it, right, and they showed it to them. This is the one, the story where Bill Gates saw it, right? He didn't squash it. I mean, he could have flat out right there and said, oh, my God, these guys are 
horrible. You know, you go find them, right? He didn't say that at all. He just said, all right, let's see what they do next, you know? Yeah. And then when you see the 360, a lot of the stuff that we did on the Xbox, the original Xbox, you started seeing that on the 360. You could you could play music in the background. You could uh you had arcades, Xbox Live arcades. Um you could play DVDs, then they had the HD player and then you know, so they got a lot of ideas for free and they implemented in the next version. You know, so they try to embrace. Essentially, they try to embrace the community because it's the community sort of had built that well, cult following for them. Well, if not embrace, at least allow to exist. You know, like well, they have right. the right yeah. to come down on each and every person who steps across that line. You know, the it's, line it's, back it's, then it's, was Xbox Live. Don't and Xbox Live didn't start out like what it is today. I mean, Xbox Live and the original Xbox, I mean, I had it since it was beta, right? But it's that's where they made their money. Don't take away their money, right? Mm -hmm. And they'll leave us alone. It's kind of like, we're not going to screw with your money and just let us play around with our toys, right? And they pretty much did that. I wouldn't say until the 360 and way into the 360 did they start you know, people started pushing the the limits that, you know, started getting people banned, started uh, making money off of right. stuff that they shouldn't be and stuff like that, you know. And uh, like hacking multiplayer lobbies too, because that, that's also something, besides the, the subscription fees and stuff, like the experience that they provide to people through those fees, you know, on a uh, walled off garden of Xbox Live. I mean, that's that's something that'll make you you know, it, talking about the morality of, of hacking and tinkering and stuff, I mean, you think of like, I mean, uh, even... as a person, I, I can't play like the Modern Warfare 3 or 2 in a lobby without, you know, risking someone modding it. So, it, you know, there's like always that sort of line that some people cross, some people don't, you know. Well, and, and the thing is, I guess we didn't see how bad it was because at the time we were on partner net, you know, so I didn't have to play with all the idiots, right? I just played with... Hey, get like ten guys together. And we're gonna play Halo Three this weekend, or Howdy. Modern Warfare Three. Can you can you kind of explain for any unprivied ears listening what what is PartnerNet? So PartnerNet is like Xbox Live, except for developers. Really, it's so they can test their games on Xbox Live. But PartnerNet, you had to have a development kit. Yes, it's like a sandbox for them. You know, if you had a, a multiplayer game, they could actually, you know, test that game in an environment where they didn't have other people playing, right? And if the game's not released, then, you know, they have to make sure it works before they release the game. So there's different reasons why they did it. But anybody that had a development kit could actually pay. So it was like having our own Xbox Live without millions of people on it, you know? And especially on the weekend, because all the development studios are not usually working on the weekend. So it's pretty much our free, our own Xbox Live for nobody but us. So so that was um, part of that for the 360, right? Yes. Did anyone get to tinker with, I believe it was also available on the OG dev kits, correct? Problem with OG that... dev kits is... Um... They weren't available. There weren't a lot available. I mean, yeah. I probably didn't get my, and I only had a debug back when the scene was going on. You know, we're talking 2005, maybe towards the end of the scene, they started becoming available. But I mean, we paid a crap load of money f just for a debug kit. Mm -hmm. You're talking. And how do how what, what do you mean like you obviously can't walk up to walk into redmond and say hey i'd like to buy one right i mean what from like defunct studio if you're allowed to say that is like from defunct studios and such i assume where they got the og ones i don't know it, it would back then it was word of mouth 
Hey, I know in the you want one uh, in the 360 scene. There was that infamous moment where a bunch were getting e-cycled because of the Red Ring of Death, and then they were getting pulled out of landfills, and then those had, you know, sort of dev kits on them, right? But that's a different case in the OG scene. So, like, and I I don't mean to pressure you, but so by all means, feel free to say that your lawyers have advised me not to mention this. Um, but you know, with the OG scene, like you, you had to be a developer. You had to be a uh, in that ethos, in that walled garden, to have you know access to the the dev kits, and which are still, by the way, and in, in perpetuity, property of Microsoft, right? So any dev kit that exists out in the wild is technically Microsoft's property, right? And most of them have a sticker that says that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Back, back the, with OG, OG oh, as you yeah. said, like dev kits were. Okay, hard to come across, but 90% of the homebrew software that was written on OG, and I mean, this is me speaking with the stuff I did, and, and I'm sure with other devs as well, were done on retail consoles because it's, technically there's no difference between what you can achieve on a retail console well, um, and, and a demo console, apart from the extra RAM. Or like well, kernel debugging, which you can get through a serial, you know, super I.O. board or something similar. Yeah, and what? you know, a modded Xbox, I mean, technically if you wanted to, you could put a debug kernel on it and you could run it as a debug unit, but you didn't need to. I mean mm-hmm. we could yep. use a modded Xbox to test stuff that you know, you would do if you had a debug kit or a div- XDK. Modded Xbox were a hell of a lot cheaper. Oh, definitely. On that note, can I make a proclamation or a request into the universe that development kits and debug unit kits are currently too expensive? If you guys could stop buying those up, that'd be great. Um, <laughs> like, they seem to have a, I don't know, this is probably true of all of Xbox collector's items in the past, you know, since COVID started seems like prices have gotten ridiculous. I'd love to have a dev kit or a debug kit someday. If you guys could stop buying them, I'd appreciate that. <laughs> so, Old Xbox dev kits and debug kits. 360 ones are like a dime a dozen, right? Yeah, I think the main value for dev and debug kits is the potential to recover some unreleased game or demo. That can happen, but it's so rare that I feel like they're overvalued for that point. And I just want to encourage anyone who is listening and interested in getting into the Xbox scene and and making code between the uh, XDK and the NXDK, there are... Uh, open source solutions for you to develop in that. You can use a retail console. You can develop code in either using the proprietary XDK that was released or leaked or whatever you want to call it. So if you're interested in joining the movement towards making apps for the console, there has never been more options than there is right now. And like you said, it's probably a lot cheaper than trying to get a dev or a debug kit. <laughs> if people yeah. need help, dumping hard drives or whatever from debug consoles, dev units, or whatever, whatever, please reach out to the Xbox preservation group. Like we're willing to help and you don't need to come to our discord or anything. We're willing to help any way we can to to get that information out there. And just to make it clear that anything that does get recovered is actually shared. It's not gate kept or shared to a small group of people, whatever we can get out there, it does make it out there. I can vouch for that. I, uh, over the past two years, I've let somebody go through every 360 Xbox hard drive that I had. Those are actually still useful for Insignia, too, because there are, uh, especially for Halo 2, there was a hopper file that, I believe it was Game Cheat on our little Discord that, that found it, just by uh, kind of sheer luck. So we didn't find the hopper file Insignia is using right now for their you know, Halo 2 launch on an Xbox. We found it on a 360 hard drive. Is that because of the backwards compatibility? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of 360 and preservation and all that, I'm going to make XCAT for 360. You all have talked me into it. <laughs> That's a huge yeah. win for your for the 360, honestly. Especially for title updates. We lost a lot of title updates. Actually, talking We're about still missing a believe... couple hundred for Xbox. I know how you feel. <laughs> I believe the 360's got a sale on at the moment with some games. 
Yeah, I think it's just like a last minute sale before it totally goes. There's been a better time to buy, you know, old 360 games for extremely cheap and and yeah. archive those and their updates as you download them from Xbox Live. Sky had some news that she, uh, I don't know if she's going to tell us about it, but she had some pretty cool news about uh, the work we've been doing. Uh, earlier, while I believe it was Equinox who was talking, I took the opportunity to test the work that I was doing. And uh, with that source modification of Smart CTL, I was able to actually dump Module 42 through USB. So it's pretty close to being ready for prime time. But here shortly, we're going to actually be able to dump the modules and the password on Western digital drives with no need for Linux. All you need is just the drive and a USB to IDE. Wow, a very this is cheap like breaking USB news. Adapter. We've been buying uh, in bulk, basically, from all over the world. We have links all over the world where you can buy them from eBay or Amazon or whatever. It's like a 5 to $10 uh, J Micron chipset USB adapter for IDE, SATA, and um, I guess mini IDE or 2.5 inch IDE as well. It's only currently tested with like a cheapo J Micron controller. Uh, still need need to test it out some more. But I'll be farming that out to some people to see if we can iron out some more bugs. But it's hopefully going to be ready for prime time here soon. As for breaking news, that DLC installer I mentioned is now up on DigiX as well. So you can go play the Halloween or the uh, Thanksgiving characters from NBA Jam. We have breaking news here on the Usual Places podcast. We're going to drive the Harcroft. <laughs> Man, we need like a field reporter on this thing. I didn't think we'd need one of those, but we need to invest into that. So while we've got um, EQ on the line, I just had a, another question for him, if that's okay. Um, is there any exciting projects that you, I guess, you or the team are currently working on? Any sneak peeks? Um, I know there was some work getting done on Aladdin's and specifically two megabyte Aladdin's. Yeah, so I've managed to do a two megabyte Aladdin, which works very similar to a Xenium way of it does its banks. So like combination of four two five six K banks or what's it, the you know, two five twelves or one thousand twenty four K bank. We also, I, sorry, I also uh, addressed an issue with uh, Jafar mod chips, which apparently they never worked with the D naught or the L frame lines never worked. Um, so you would have to just permanently ground those lines just to get your Xbox to boot. And uh, while I was at it, I, I fixed those issues as well. And I'm currently looking at doing the uh, Xilinx based Aladdin mod chips to do the same sort of treatment for it. And I'm looking to do some improvements to Xenium as well. So that's it on the mod chip sort of the legacy and, mod chip and, side of things. <laughs> and I'm guessing all those fixes um, will be published. Yeah, they're already live on my uh, the repos on the T our team resurgent repo. So, but if you need any uh, direction, just give me a shout and I'll put you in the right direction. I was testing a two mega lens oh. last night for Equinox and it flawless it works perfectly so four banks plus tsop with, with an old aladdin xt and a two meg chip can i ask about prometheo if running on mod show is that something we can talk about or is that like still on the future um <laughs> well i can say that um yeah i have prometheus working on uh, mod xo um there's still lots of things to iron out but yeah, it's looking promising. That's really cool to hear. The fact that I can run on RP2040 chips is really cool to see. I'm, I'm curious what can happen from that. And all yeah. the weird, like the things you can do with like what the GPIO pins from there and how it can interface with um, LCD screens or OLEDs, you know, yeah. there's, there's a lot of possibility there. So a lot just... of possibility for 16 player uh, Snake. Just going to throw, that, throw yeah. that out there again. <laughs> And just imagine <laughs> if you have a 16 megabyte um, Pico um, or RP2040, that would equate to being able to do like uh, 60 odd banks of 256K. 
So um, <laughs> certain things are being designed to actually do it. So l limit it to like say sixteen banks, and then which will give enough space for some cool features coming. Hey everybody, I got to take off. Thanks for the invite. Hope to catch the next one. Thank take you, care. Yeah, thank you, Roddy. No problem. Talk to you guys soon. Thanks. See you, mate. So just before we, we end the show, I guess with while we're on the subject of mod chips, is it just me or does it feel like the 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 cheap mod or whatever was I guess classified as a cheap mod is now a dying solution considering that, you know, the likes of the Mocho or the RP twenty forty chips are coming to light because I mean just hopping on, on AliExpress and just buying one of them is you know, you can find them almost as cheap as a dollar. And that's probably cheaper than what you can get any um, cheap mod at the moment. So it's quite impressive what um, Shell X has, has come up with and definitely looking forward to see Prometheus and whatever else we can get running on that. Well, with Prometheus, there's no, or oh, sorry, Mod Show, there is no need to have a um, CPLD in there because the, the, the RP2040 itself is doing uh, the heavy lifting, which means that that mod shift price gets cut, cut in half essentially like it's going to be like a six or seven dollar mod chip to produce in quantity of one in quantity of a hundred it could be like you know four dollars or something also the uh one of the cplds for the open xenium has been sunsetted it's, it's going eol so there are replacements coming up for that but they just may not be needed if you have a chip you can produce for you know next to nothing at home that's yep. right it definitely opens up a lot more avenues now yeah there's a lot of cool open source projects going on right now. But as we uh, round this episode of episode two, I just want to thank everyone for hanging out, spending the about two hours telling your stories and interesting facts and stuff like that that, that some people who are new to the scene might not have known. This episode will be published on Spotify and YouTube. We'll be pushing links out on the Discord channel and the Xbox scene Discord. And if anyone wants to be a participant and be a speaker on this, we'd love to hear your stories that maybe people haven't heard of before or what you're working on. If you have any cool projects, feel free to reach out to the usual places, uh, Discord, via the forum, via comments. We, uh, we will read them all. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Greatly appreciated. And, and I want to say thanks to the guests as well that came on. Really appreciate your feedback. Yeah, thank you to everyone. And thank you also to Aguero for uh, also spearheading this this operation. So we're going to move over to the uh, the voice chat. If anyone is hanging out in here and you want to continue on, we'll be hanging out in there. But other than that, this has been episode two of the Usual Places Modcast. This will be going up soon, and I hope you have learned something new, and we'll see you next time. So good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thanks for having us. <laughs> I'm going to bed, so good night. Good morning. <laughs> That time for me as well. Have a good night. Later, Sky. Bye. Thanks again. Oh my God. <laughs> nice. <laughs>